Okay, so um, async. I'm gonna go into, I don't know if I have any notes in here or not. I have the notes in here, but these are a little bit, um, okay, though, so the Ajax on the service integration here, this PDF here, um, these are both from the old book. So the Ajax is still, you know, pretty the same, hasn't changed yet. Um, there are different ways now how to do, how to make Ajax calls. There are, you know, there's a jQuery Ajax, and there are uh, a couple ones that are much more um, robust. And we'll look at the fetch is one of the most popular ones. Um, how to use fetch to, you know, actually fetch data from the server side and things like that. Okay, so the async uh, PDF here uh, really talks about something called the, um, if you read through, just ignore anything that has to do with the, the dollar sign uh, defer. We're not going to do that. Um, right here, okay, this is the jQuery uh, stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the promise, okay, so what a promise is and how we use promise to fetch data and things like that. So all the promises, the fetch, the Ajax, um, and, and you learn the Node.js as well, all those are just, you know, asynchronous operations. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, let's see, I'm gonna go here and um, this is not, I wanna run. Yeah, so last week, okay, so last week we looked at the, uh, the um, back end, right? We created a very simple application that um, runs uh, two links, okay? The home link, if you remember, that loads this home page. And then we have and the one for the about link that runs this page, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, I don't remember if we, um, so the about page here and then the Ajax, let me see if I remember this. Okay, so the index, yeah, we, we did read it, okay, so yeah. So we did do the read. So initially the app here is very simple, right? We learned how to uh, output data to the web page using really, really difficult method using the response write function. You write all your HTML manually this way. This is incomplete, right? Usually you will write a doc type just like the index over here and print everything out there. And then we switch over to the um, Express.js framework, right? We learned it from Express.js. We can then have a better way to create applications using these uh, um, re request types, the get request. I did not do the um, delete and put and post yet, but you can certainly do those. And so we have a request for the home page, the root directory that we read a file, HTML file, right? This page here, the entire document, read that, and then we output that the content of that file to the response write. Okay, so it's the same thing as saying, I'll copy everything here, all the text here, and um, put it right in here, right? Okay, so this method here is fine, again, there's a better way to do that now. And so the better approach is of course, to use a, a library called handlebars. And we'll take a look at that in a minute, <clears throat> but I wanna cover asynchronous. So what is asynchronous and why is it so important? Um, so what I'm gonna do is maybe I'll use this about page. So since it's already here, uh, uh, let's say, but was it home page? Yeah, the home page is fine. I'll just use this home page here. And we'll use this to um, just demo. You know what? Maybe not a good idea. Let, let's let's go over to a unit six here. And I'll do something separately. Okay, so unit six here. Uh, I will put a file in here. We'll use the um, um okay, so we'll call this, what should I call it? Um, callback, I'll call it callback.js, okay? So to understand how asynchronous works, we have to look at how callback functions works in JavaScript. Now, JavaScript uh, functions are really important in, I mean, they have very, not only important, but they have very um, unique features in, in JavaScript. Okay, so that was some notes in here, okay? Um, these are callback functions. You will see that asynchronous is actually um, 
you know, piggyback on how a callback functions are used. And you were seeing this before, you used it, you know how you do like the event listener, right? You have like, uh, for example, um, something, right? something that add event listener and you have in here, you have a click event and then you have a callback function here. So this is a callback function, right? Use a lot of callback functions here. And, and because of this callback function, this is actually asynchronous. What, why is it asynchronous? Well, because this code never runs, right? it never runs, it waits, and even though your page loads and run in the background, it will only trigger and run this function only when you click that button or that element, right? And then it will, it will invoke this function here uh, asynchronously, right? So that's what happens when we have a callback function. A callback function, so here's some, some features about functions. Uh, functions in JavaScript are, uh, one is that functions are, um, are what's called a um, first class citizen. Okay, they call it first class citizen. Um, you hear the term citizen sometimes first class functions or first class objects. Okay, what that means is that um, functions in JavaScript, not true in all languages, by the way, and be like JavaScript and, and Python. Um, yeah, maybe PHP too, I'm not sure. What that means is that, um, I'll just put some notes in here so we can see. Is that one, uh, it can be used um, as a variable, okay? That is one of the rules, one of the features about what's, what does it mean first class citizens or functions? That a function can be used as variables and we used this before, like for example here, like uh, we have like constant um, talk is equal to function, right? And then, you know, you do that. Okay, so you can see this function here is used, um, it's assigned to a variable called talk. So now this talk is actually a variable but it's, it's, it's been used like a variable, even though it's not, right? So this is a little bit, little bit weird how we do that. And um, this is also a part of the other part because it can be used as a variable. Um, well, I mean, not just that, but B is that it's also um, can be assigned, I guess, can be assigned to a variable. And, and this is known as the function expression. You've probably heard this before. Okay, because this expression, you would sign out to a variable and then you can use that. A third feature about that is that a function um, you can pass, can be passed as an argument to another function. Right, so, so some functions, I mean, some languages won't let you do that. Um, like Java, for example, it's very hard to do that. I'm not sure if it lets you do that. What that means is that this function, if I have a function here called, uh, you know, get user, or actually get um, yeah, user or something, okay? And I can, um, I can pass another function here. So let's say, um, we'll put here, I just got another function. Yeah, talk, right? Talk is a function, I can put talk into it. Okay, so this is a function. It's an expression function, but it is a function. And in here I could put like, um, maybe we'll just put a console log. Um, hello, okay, that very simple function, that's a very simple thing, just one simple message um, does that. And I pass this function as a argument to another function called get user, right? You can do that. And then inside here, then you can invoke that function inside here. So you can do like talk like that. Okay. So this function has been used as an argument. You pass to that another function, and then it's invoked inside this function. The, the name here I use talk. It, it doesn't have to be. Um, I mean, not the way it is here. So let me just put here. Let's call it the fn. Okay. So we use fn. So when I invoke it. When I call the function get user, I can pass the function talk to it. Yeah, I mean, I probably explained incorrectly. Um, 
can be passed as an argument uh, refers to this, this part here, okay, it's part C. So I can pass the function talk into the get user as an argument. Notice I did not invoke the function. If I do that, that's different, right? If you invoke it, or if you call it, then it's no longer a function, it's the result of this function. If it, if it, if it returns something, whatever the data return will be passed to this function, then this will be passed to the get user as in this f and here. Okay, so if you want to use it as a function, then you don't invoke that function. You just pass it as a variable. And then it, it will be assigned to the fn it's a, as a reference pointing to the same talk function and you invoke inside this get user function. Okay, and then, so if I do this way and if I go to my uh, terminal down here and let me go into the unit six. Okay, so if I invoke this line, this function call callback, you, you, you could do that by um, typing uh, node callback. Okay, you can invoke functions, uh, JavaScript call here using node. So it will call that and you will see that the message hello is printed down here. Okay, and uh, that's because, right, because you pass a function to another function and I call the function talk inside here, right? As opposed to outside here. If I just put talk, I'm gonna get the same hello message, right? So I, I let another function does the invocation of that function. And this is called a callback function, okay? You pass a function to another function. And so this function is a callback because you know it, it calls this one here and it calls back. I'm not sure how we explain that, but this is a scenario where a callback function is. Okay, so I just did this way. This looks very similar to, like this part here, looks very similar to an event listener, right? Except an event listener has two parameters, like they click here and then you have a function called talk. Okay, same idea. If I have two, two parameters, let's say if I have like a var or, or a va variable like val, then it looks exactly like that. If I put here, you know, click, or if I, if I put like, um, maybe like a um, world like that, okay? And and it looks like that, right? So the callback function, actually you usually, usually do something like this. They put the error function right in here. Okay, you do that, you know, most of the time, you, you remember that one? So by the same token, this is how it's done. I can pass in a variable here into the second parameter. I pass a callback function into this variable here. And let's say that this function uh, talk, if I had, if I were to, uh, you know, a pat takes a parameter. Let's say if I take a parameter called, um, I don't know, um, call it data, right? Now I can put here as a console log, I say hello, and then data like that. So now I pass the word to this variable. I invoke this function, which is really talk. Inside here, I pass a value to that function. Like that, okay? And I'll turn this off here. And then you see that now if I call it down here, it prints the word or the message, hello, data, right? Whatever data is, data is the word, okay? So I can pass data to a function as a string and also another function, this is called a callback function because you called it later down here. And then inside this function, I can pass the data to that function, how we design it, because initially, I mean, I changed that to accept a variable here. So I can pass the data to that function. It does its job down inside here and you see that the result here, right? So that's how a uh, callback function works. So if you call this function here, inside here, inside the body of the event, it will check the type of event. That's why you're able to use like click event, you know, mouse enter, mouse leave, uh, you know, on change or things like that, right? It's just this variable here. I can pass it, I can say, if the value is equal to world, then do something. If it's hello, then do something else inside there. So um, this way, the way I have it here, you already know that because I'm using function outside here as a variable and I 
put it here, right? If I don't intend to use this talk function ever again, then usually you could put this whole thing, right? Inside here, you turn this into an error function if you want to, like that, right? So it's an error function, it looks just like this one here, except this one didn't take any parameters, but we add one parameter here. And so it behaves exactly the same way. Or you can put the whole function here inside of two, like this. That's completely uh, valid. Okay, and, and uh, you see that, you know, if I do it this way, maybe it makes more sense this way. So it's a function, you pass a function to the other function, and then you, this function goes into the fn, and then it passes a function value to its data, and it does the operation. Okay, so that's the callback function. Um, it happens a lot in JavaScript, and you will see that you know as you get better, you can also um, you know uh, use this quite extensively. Not only that, function can also uh, uh, sometimes also called high order. I should say our first class citizens, and also um, sometimes the word high order. How order means that they can operate on other functions. So I just show you that it can take it can take a function as a, an, a parameter, or you can pass as an argument, right? Not only that, a function can also return another function. Okay, so so this function get user, it does not return any data, right? It, it just invokes another function here, and then it does the, the thing here. I can also have this function return another function, right, <clears throat> internally. So I could put here, you know, maybe, 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 so inside this function, let's do this. If I do a function called, um, I, don't, I don't know, let's just say uh, uh, magic number, right, or not, something like that. And this function here, um, Uh, let's see, this function here does something. So it would do like console log, just a magic number. I'll put like the math random, and then you put some numbers in here, okay? So it will console log that to the user. And then I return that function called magic number. Okay, again, notice I did not invoke it. If you invoke it, you're gonna see this, okay? So, what does it mean? So it means if I go into the get user here, and let's say that I call that function and it returned, it does this function call inside. So you're gonna see the word hello world here. And then not only that, it's going to return another function called magic number is defined inside this function back. So I can put over here, I put here constant, um, let me just put it, uh, just put here magic. Fn is equal to that. Okay, so I can use again use a function as a um, assigned to another variable. I invoke it here. I invoke this function. It will go inside. Invoke this function value here. Return this magic number to magic fn. And so now, once I have the magic fn, I can invoke the magic fn because it's a function, right? So it comes back out as a function. It is a function, but it never invoke it yet until I invoke it down here. So you're gonna see a magic, the hello world, and then followed by a random number. Okay, so you can see how, uh, you know, confusing this can get, but how also powerful and useful this can also get. It can do a lot of things. It can return a function back and you can invoke that function in the future time. Okay, so this one here is just waiting. I can invoke it later. All right. <clears throat> so what is the advantage of these callback functions? There are a lot of advantages <clears throat> because, you know, um, like the, the fn function here, right? So I pass this function as an argument to this get user. 
if I go back and just call the talk like that, okay, you will see the advantage of this. So this one here um, talks because whatever, how, however you implement this talk function, right, you pass to that. What if I have another function that I want to pass to that function? Let's just say I have another one. We'll call it, um, just duplicate this. We'll call it walk, right? Let's just say um, walking. Uh, something like that. And this also takes a data, right? And then here, um, so, so in this time, instead of saying, you know, talk the world, I can call or just call the get user this time, okay, without using the magic. I can use the uh, walk function, but I put here like the mall, like a message like that, right? So you're gonna see that I have two separate function calls and they're using the same function called get user, but I pass different data to it and I pass different function to that, that get user function, right? Without changing anything inside the get user function, I get different result because what if I pass to, right? Because it will invoke inside that parent function. So I get different result out of that. Okay, so that is the uh, um, advantage of using callback function this way. So pretty cool. Uh, you can write a function, you can pass any function you want. This function can do a lot of things, not just a very simple hello data here where I can do so that this function can actually build a, build a website inside here, right? Return a web page or, or do some data fetch to another server and returns the data back and, and so forth. Okay, so that's the function. And another feature you want, you can look into is, is um, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do a different time. <clears throat> maybe it gets a little bit confusing. All right, um, so that's that. That's the callback functions. Now I'm gonna switch over. So because the callback function works this way, so you can see that I can call this function in a future time, right? I didn't invoke it now. It comes back as a function I can use in the future time. So you kind of delay that function. So. This is like um, what's it called the motivation to create asynchronous operations. So async, I'm going to create another function here. Um, we'll call it um, uh, async s and y. Async.js. Okay. So asynchronization, we call so JavaScript is a single thread language. That means everything runs sequentially from top to bottom, right? So if I put, um, uh, if I put like a let uh, a is equal to one, if I do a function call, print, if I, put, if I pass a parameter here, like v a value, your console log value, right? And if I call um, print, a, you're gonna see that print to the screen, right? So if I go down here again, do a no async, you see that prints number one here, okay? Because it, it works this way. Um, if you remember the functions are, uh, if you create a function this way, they are special because they always get hoisted to the top, even though I called it later, uh, or I, I define that later down here, it still, it still works as fine. Okay, function uh, behaves, you know, behaves that way, you can see, still works fine. However, if you put it to error function, then it's different, okay? So if I put it to error function, like const print, and then error function like this, now it's, now it's different because it's a variable, but it's a function. And if you call that, it's gonna fail. You can see that it has an error, it says print is not initialized because I'm trying to call line three and print was never there yet. Right, so in order for this to work, you have to call it later, like down here, after it's been created. Okay, so if I do it now, you see that it works fine, right? Or if you call it before it, 
okay? You have to call inside another function for this to work because again, it fails, okay? So usually you call inside another function, then it's okay. Or otherwise you use a function called set uh, timeout. This is, this is a function that uh, used to handle um, asynchronous. So this function takes uh, two arguments. The first is required, the second is optional. The first is a callback function. Okay, so again, error function, you see this quite a lot. And the second is a timer. How many seconds or how many milliseconds do you wanna to wait to call this? So you can put zero, we can leave it out, it's fine. If you leave it out, then it will be just one, um, zero, default to zero. If you put one, it'll be one milliseconds. I think it measures in milliseconds maybe. Okay, so this set timer function is a special function. As you can see, it calls a callback function. What this one does is that it will invoke this function at a later time. So even though I call up here, it doesn't matter here or at the very top doesn't matter, right? So both of these variables are uh, created later in the future. But when you see this timeout function, it will wait until all of the rest of your code run only run only once, and then it will go back and then run the internal function here. So in this case, if I run it down here, you see that it works just like before, okay? And that is the asynchronous operation. It runs asynchronously. Otherwise, it will run sequentially. It, is, it, it will not work because these are created later in the future. Okay, so the set timeout, the set interval, and this another one called set immediate functions. These are very special functions that allow you to do asynchronous operations calls. It will wait one tick. It's like a millisecond, but actually it's faster than milliseconds. It's, they call it a tick. Um, so one cycle through it'll wait one cycle until all these have been created. Once they are created, now they exist in memory. So that's why the next cycle through, you call the internal function, and then I'm able to call and print and also pass the letter A because now at that time, these have already been created in memory. Okay, so that is the logic behind asynchronous operations. It waits until the next um, cycle through. And, and that's what happens when we, in a previous exercise, remember instead of my site, when I call the index here, I call the read file, okay? When it, the read file here is an asynchronous call. You can see that if you have most over this, it tells you it says asynchronously reads the entire content of the file. That means as it's reading the data, it can process some other stuff, right? After that, and then until that's done, it, once you get the whole data back, then it will go back and then you know process the data inside here. The other function is if you read it, if you put like a fs dot, you see the two of them. One is called read file. This is the asynchronous. This one is the synchronous one. Okay, so usually you don't want to call this function. This one here will force everything after this function to halt until you read the data first, and then you continue on your code. So usually you don't want to stop that unless you, you want to do that purposely, but um, very rarely you would use that function. Okay, so this is a callback fun function inside here. It is a callback function from here to here, right? It, it call it does that um, after, okay, after it reads the file inside a home HTML. If it reads it, it's able to get all the data and the data will be passed to the second parameter we call data here and then we output inside here. If it's not able to find it, then it will generate an error message and it will pass that to the error. And then we'll cache the error inside here, we'll print this out. So these not gonna run, right? So that's what the, um, the async is for. And so, uh, you know, in Node.js and uh, JavaScript, you can use that to read files um, on the back end. Okay. Um, all right, so, and then, um, you know, let's see, I want to cover one more thing, recover JS file. Um, okay, so let's look at, let's look at um, a function called, um, I think called promise, all right? So promise, let me go over here and uh, just load you this link here. It's probably easier if you look at this, this file. So over here, 
<clears throat> on the Mozilla site. So a promise is an object, okay, the events object that represents a, a, a object that um, what's called a proxy, okay? A proxy means like, it's not the real data yet, right? For a value, because the value could be the actual data or it could be an error message, okay? So that's what, the, again, so again, read the information here. A promise is usually when you call a promise, the operation returns coming back will have either one of these three states, okay, uh, conditions. Depending state, this is when you actually make a promise. Um, so you, you issue a promise to, let's say, read a file or, um, you know, process or fetch some data from a database server somewhere on the internet, right? So when you initialize or initiate that initial promise is in the pending state. So if you check the status, it will just say pending. It, it's waiting until the data comes back, okay? And then when it comes back, it's guaranteed to either be a fulfilled, means successfully got the data back with no problem, or there's an error and you, it, it gets rejected. Okay, so three things will happen when you initial a promise and, and it's guaranteed to give you a one of those three. So it will never be nothing else but one of those three. And you always wanna get the fulfill, right? That's the goal. So if you look at this here, a, a, so you, you create a promise, it's an object down here, you can see it, um, it goes out and then, you know, whatever that thing you wanna do, and it can either fulfill coming back, and that if it's come back successfully, then we call that promise that's been settled. Okay, it's a settled, then you got the data back, and then you can then, you know, do whatever with, with that data. You can also uh, pass it to another promise. You keep going down the chain that way, right? Or you end here and then just um, pass it to another function, or you can just process the data or output to the, to the screen. If it comes back as a rejection, then you get a rejected, that's an error, then you, you know, display the error or you catch the error, do something about the error. You can end here, or you can pass another data to another promise and keep doing it again, right? So this is the, the uh, idea behind the promise. And how, we, how you create it is like down here. <clears throat> this one's a little bit confusing, um, but let's go down here further, okay? Um, okay, so this is probably better. So when you create a promise, so the promise is built into JavaScript already. So you don't have to do any additional loading or, or, um, or things like that. You just use it. And uh, you can use the promise um, like this way here. You can create a separate variable. Remember, uh, this is a new promise. So it's a constructor, right? Object constructor. You create a promise object. So this promise class or constructor takes a function, so from here to here, okay, and, and you know, let's let's do this. Let's copy this, or just copy that one, and um, I'll go down here and do a um, not a sync here, but let's create a new one. I'll call it promises. Promises.js. So this is the example from the book. Okay. So um, this function promise, this constructor takes a function, a callback function, if you remember, this whole thing here, it's a callback function. So if I were to rewrite this, you can see clearly, it's like that, change it to a regular function, right? The callback function from there to here. And if you wanna take it out, you can. You can take it out completely like this, and let's put it out here. Call it function and give it a name. We we'll call it, um, um, you know, do promise or something. Okay, so you pass to this function you promise like that, right? So you remember how I did before with the um, my example? Okay. So if you remember the, uh, the callbacks, right? Same thing. I I do here, I, I pass in the talk function to it. So you do the same thing. You pass in the do promise you create to that promise constructor. And this promise takes two objects. Okay, this, as you can see down here, is a, is a resolve and you pass in a parameter. Similar to how I did here, my callback, right? I do a function, I pass in a parameter. 
All right, so you pass in a callback function and it invokes inside here. The same idea. It invokes the resolve function up here. We call it resolve and, and rejection because that's the way it is. You can call it whatever you want. I can call it an A and then B, doesn't matter, right? Well, all it is is that the first one is the successful one. The second is the failure one, okay? So, so let's go back to where it was before. So really the all, that's all it is. And then um, when it comes back, okay, because we, we call the resolve function. So this will return the data here will be returned. Uh, the word foo here we return. Let's put here good return. Okay, after 300 milliseconds or so. Returns back. And then once it comes back to a promise object. So this is a promise object. Now, once I create an object, so if I will print console log is out, you see that okay, if I console log that, this is node um, promises. You can see that it's a it's a promise. You can see it's pending, right? It's waiting because at this state it's waiting um, until you do something further. Okay, so it's a promise. After that, once it's come back, then you can check the data coming back is either good or bad. Okay, so in this case, we are forcing to be good. I'm forcing that to be good. I did not do a rejection here. Um, I can, I will show you in a minute. So in this way, wait for 300 milliseconds and then return the word good to the result. The result is good. So it comes back. Then to my promise, I can use what's called a then function. Okay, so if you if you remember, if you back in, back in here, right, you see, it goes and call it then function. So you can call many then functions. Instead of then function, you call more functions again. This is again, another function, another function as well. You have the fulfillment, the rejection, fulfillment, rejection. Okay, and you keep adding that down the chain. And I'll, I'll tell you what this then means. So what it does is that it calls a promise, it resolves and it sends the data back to the next function called then. Then this then function takes another function, another callback function that looks like this, an error function again. So the, the data coming back, whatever this resolve re returns, you put that inside a variable called data, right? Or anything you want, just another variable, doesn't matter, okay? So the variable data here will contain the word good. And inside here, maybe I can just console log that. Data. Okay, so so that is a callback function again. You pass into a then function, so the same idea, right? A lot of callbacks. So now, if I run it, you see that the initially when I create a promise, it's in a pending state, and then I wait until after that the data comes back. Then I can go ahead and then, you know, run this internal function because the, the data is automatically passed to this variable here. You have to include that variable. And then because it's a data, it's a good data, it will then log that to the console. You see the word good down here. And then we're done, okay? If you want to do more, let's say I got the data here. I do something here. Let's say I do like a, a data is, um, I'm gonna add that to um, like say the word good morning. I got the new data, and then I want to return that data back to another function down here. So I can do like a return data like that. Okay, so this function then here calls a callback function. It does something inside here. It returns some data back. In this case, it returns the actual data word, uh, good plus morning, it's a string, right? So it returns this one here. It's a new string back to this then function, and then it passes to the next then function. So you get, again, you, you, you then you chain to another then function here, and the same thing happens again. So this function is a separate function. I can put another data here again. It behaves exactly the same as above. Now I can console log this data again. So the second time I print this out, it's gonna say good morning because I have a new data. Okay, so again, I, this function then 
right? Invoke some data, it returns something. Similar to how I have here. This function get user, it does something, returns some data, right? To, to magic fun. This one here returns back to this then function, the next then function, and you use it here. So now if I run it, you're gonna see the word good for the first then function. And then I pass it on down the chain to the next then function. And it does again, console log that, and you can keep going. Okay, so this is what's called a, um, a chaining, right? You met the chaining. So I chain that to the promise object here the first then, and usually it's, it's hard to see this way. So you see the, how they do it, they'll do it like this. Okay, I, I chained that there so that, you know, they are chained like so. So these are called uh, method chaining or sometimes it's called thenable, right? Thenable, that's what it means. So you can see how this works here. Now, this only works because uh, the then function here works because the data is good, because we got a good data, okay? If I change it around, and if I don't call it good, I call the other one, let's say reject. We'll call it bad, All right? It calls the other function reject. Now, when I run it, you're gonna see that it has some errors now, right? It knows that because I'm calling the rejection, it's calling the second, the second function over here. And the promise of return back say, hey, it failed because whatever it is, you know, it's bad. So it, it, it calls that function. So therefore, when it comes, when the promise is re received the data coming back, if it's a bad data, then it would not call all your then functions. So what you do in this case is you want to catch the error. And you do that by down here, you call a, at the end here or something, a cache error. So again, the error takes another callback function. You put here the error message and then something like that. And then now a console log the error. Okay, whatever error is, it's gonna be passed here. So in our case, the error is just, just a bad data. I'll put a bad data here, okay? All right, so you have to catch it down here. So now if I run it again, you see that if return, it runs this catch function, then the data, the bad data here returns as a string to the error variable here. And we console log that out here. So you see the bad data, okay? So that's how promise works, okay? You create your new promise, okay? It'll either reject or, um, either re reject or resolve. If the resolve comes back, if it's good, then it will call the first then function inside here. And you can stop here if you want to. If you want to do more, you can pass data back. You can return, you have to return, okay? If you don't return, that means that the data ends there. And then, um, you know, uh, it will just stop there. Otherwise, if there's an error, then all your then functions will skip and it will catch it and it ends right there. So again, it guarantees those three states, right? They're pending or a, a um, successful or a failure. Okay, so you can see that how I did here. I, do, I put promise here because I want to show you, but usually you will see that you, you know, they put it like just inside here as a, as a function like this. Okay, so I don't need the external function. I just do it here um, as an error function because usually this you know, never gets reused again use only once here and then um, that's it. So in here I could do, um, for example, let's do this. I can do like a, you know, um, let's just put like a let n is equal to math random. Um, something like that, right? I think it's a decimal number. So you can say if n is, um, you know, uh, less than 0 0.5, then we say uh, resolve. Good. Else, resolve bad. So you can do that, right? So now you have either a good or bad result. You can reject it or, or keep the good one. Maybe you can do a format. Okay, so that's how you can resolve a good or bad. 
And so now if I run it, you see that it the first run, it, it gets a good because the number was actually you know less than that. We can we can console logs, so we can see. You can see that when I run this, so and it's 0.6, it's bigger than five. So therefore it's reject that. So we get the error, right? Returns the bad data. I do it again. Uh, point two is good. So we, I got the resolve, returns a good one, and you get the good data. Okay. So this is a um so this is a a synchronous call, right? Because I'm I'm doing using the set timeout. And so this is where you would call a um, you know, a file from a server. If the data comes back is good data, then you resolve the data. Otherwise, the data was not reachable, so you return the bad data back. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'll stop for the uh, promises here. Um, that is all I want to cover for you. Uh, again, I'll read the PDF a little bit different from what I show you here, but that's it, it should be very familiar. And then also read the uh, the document on the. Um, um, on the other side, so you can see how this works. So the promises are um, how they're used behind uh, asynchronous operations. And then um, now I will do um, one more and then we will take a break. Okay, so now I want to look at a We call this the um, um, call it Ajax, okay? Ajax, AJS. Okay, so this is the Ajax for the XHTML. This is the Ajax call. And usually you call the XML HTTP, or I should call it um, XML XH. XML HTTP request, right? So we use that to read data in the back end and, and so forth. Okay. So, <clears throat> for example, if you have some data back here, let's create a file. I uh, would call it uh, user.js, uh, that JSON. Okay. I create a JSON data object here. Um, just one user have an ID. One two three has a username. Call it my name. Okay, so very simple. One is a single object, so that's a user data. And the um, let's say close all these here. The AJAX call, right? So the AJAX is like this. You can click a, a constant x h r is equal to new XML from XML HTTP request. It's a function constructor, okay? So you instantiate an, an object of that type. And then the next thing you wanna do is you send the data out, right? So you can say HR, you can actually open a connection. And it takes, you know, a, a string, which is the URL. Um, so the, the method here is like the get, put, uh, delete, and things like that. So the default is gonna be the get request. You can put that here. We can leave it out. If you leave it out, it'll be defaulted to a get request. And then the second here is the URL. So URL is the file name. So I put here, um, let's put a variable here. Uh, let uh, file is equal to the um, file name. It's called um, users.json. Okay, so that's the file name, right? So if we hit the file, <clears throat> you open that, and the third parameter is called uh, the asynchronous, either true or false. So usually you want to leave it as a default, which is true. So it calls it asynchronously. If you put false explicitly, then it will call this file, it will run this file, it will wait until it's finished. So usually you don't want to use false, you use true. You can put it here, you can leave it out. It's by default, it's true in a way. Okay. So um, you open the connection and then uh, you can then send it. You send the connection over 
request over because we're not passing data. We don't need get request. It's a retrieval. So we're not sending anything over. And then once you get that, then you need to check the state, right? We want to check to make sure that the, uh, the data is actually um, uh, um, return, right? Coming back or returning, you need, you need to check that. And so you do a um, function called dot on ready change state change. This function can, uh, there are a few functions you can use. One is this function. Another is like the, you can add event listener and then, um, you know, so let's do this one first. It's a function, call it function, like that. Okay, and then you can wait and check to see the state of the XHR. So the XHR has a state call uh, done or the, the, um, the status of, um, I mean, done or the state of, of four, which is good. So you can check to see here if the XHR done is true, you can check that. And the XHR um, ready state, in this case, it's the number four. I mean, it's all good. If that's the case, then you got the data back, right? So it's waiting for that, that state to be true. Kind of like the promise, right? If the promise is true, then return the data. You, you, you can fetch the data, you do something with the data. So over here then, that means is that I got the data so I can set um, data is assigned to the XHR as an object of response text, response uh, text type, come back as a string of text. Okay, it's always a text. And then you have to convert it to JSON uh, um, and, and use it. Okay, so once you got the data, then let's say I'm gonna console log that to, oops, data. Okay, so that is how the XML HTTP request object works. Okay, so let's see if this works. I'm gonna call it the node AJAX. Um, let's see, it's an error. Okay, so this one doesn't like it. It's probably um, I wonder if it's um, on the only on the on the on the web. Yeah, it's a it's a web. Yep, yeah, it's only on the web, so it, it doesn't work on, on Node.js. Um, so let me have to attach it to the web. So let's create a new HTML here, really quick, <clears throat> and I'll link it to that script. It's the Ajax, right? Okay. And I'll just run this one here in the browser so we can see, <clears throat> hopefully. Okay, so it's over here. So when I run it and the browser over here, okay, you can see that it loads the data already, okay. So when I refresh it, okay, so I see it returns the data. Um, so it wants to fetch the data, that's user.json, and then it opens that file, if it, if it can find it, and then you wait for the state to be done. And if that's the case, then go ahead and extract the data from the XHR object, response text object. This one here stores the data. You assign it to another variable, and then you console log or use that in that, in that case. Okay, so that's for that, right? If you do like uh, an error, let's say if I put, um, you know, users like that, right? That's an error. You can see that it has an error already. It, it's because that, that's not found. Okay. <clears throat> and um, so that's, that's the, the uh, way to do this for using the AJAX method. Now the other method I will show you here is uh, the fetch. So I'm just gonna comment this out. Um, yeah, let's let's put this inside a function here. Function um, 
Ajax. So we're not gonna call this one, okay? So I'll leave it here so we can compare. So now it should not call the function. If I go back and refresh it, it should not work. Okay, there's nothing happening there, okay? So now let's show the other one. <clears throat> the other type is called the fetch. Okay, so a fetch, like that. The first one takes the URL. So here again would be the file name, whatever that was. If it's successful, then we attach the then function. If it's, uh, um, if it's good, right? If it has an error, then you call the error here, okay? So it looks kind of similar to the, um, you know, the, the callback, right? <clears throat> so it does a uh, then and then. Actually, you, you should, it takes two thens here. So it looks like the promise I showed you earlier. It has like a, it does the promise, then we see some data, then you do another something, and then you catch an error. The same idea. So here, I fetch the file. If it's successful, then I call the data function. Here again, takes a function, the word they put here, um, I call the response. Usually the response object comes back as a promise. This error function here. And sometimes you would yeah, yeah, use error function like this, and then you're going to return the data from the response dot json okay you call that json function and what it will do is that it will convert your data to json data it is already but it's going to convert anyway and then we turn this data back to the next then function down here so now this is what had the data again another error function and then inside here you would then print it out so you can then now you get the actual data print here and then you're done okay if it's an error and you catch it here so again error and the console log error here okay so this is the fetch um now if i go to the browser you should see that has similar result right already running we refresh it you see that it returns the data, the user object like I had before. It's a JSON this time as opposed to a string because we converted to a JSON data, okay? And if you happen to like uh, use the users here instead like this, then you get an error. You see that error is that it's not found, okay? This, this message here is this message down here. I can print a message here. So if you want to put something else, you can say um, error, no, um, something like that you're gonna see that the error message is printed as opposed to the default uh, message. But if you want, usually, you know, you would print the actual error message, which you saw earlier here. So you can say error and then put here, error dot, let's see, is there a message? Yeah, um, let's see. I don't know if there's a get message from that. Probably not. Sometimes there's a get message error, you can get the metric message. No, it doesn't have it. So just the error, okay? So it has an error and then whatever the error is, it says, you know, not a valid JSON, but really it's not found, okay? So, and then now we have no error, so we got that data. So that's the fetch uh, as opposed to the other one, right? If you compare this two, let me clean it up. So the Ajax using the XMHTP object, um, which is this guy here, actually, this one should have been down here. Okay. And using this approach or using the fetch approach. Okay. The only thing is that this is an older, older technology. So um, it was still being used today, but people are actually switching over to the fetch. It's a newer approach and actually it's nicer and cleaner to, to write, right? And so forth. I put a lot of, you know, paren here. It's confusing because I just want to make sure you understand. But really, if you have a single parameter here in the function, then usually you can remove that and just put the variable here, the single parameter. And if it has only one statement to return this, 
So this is, is usually rewritten to do just something like this. I could remove the arrows, the curly braces, and it just do something like that. So you can see it's short. Okay, so same thing. You can remove the space, the, the parentheses here. You don't need the parentheses. So your code is a little bit cleaner. Okay, same thing down here. And if all I'm doing just one statement, then you can remove that. You can see how clean this gets now. Same idea here. And of course, you can always pass to another function to do the processing. So you can see now it's short, right? Very short and sweet. And it should, it should still work just like before. As you can see, no problem, okay? Okay, so um, those are the you know different approaches to all these synchronous operations. Um, there are many more, but I think I'll stop here for this part and we'll take a break. Uh, a 10 minute break, we'll come back and then we'll, uh, I'll show you how to use the, um, the handlebars and then we'll be done for tonight. So I'll see you back in 10 minutes, okay? I was actually, you know, um, thinking about doing the handlebar stuff, but I think I'm gonna wait until later uh, assignments because I think probably move a little bit too fast on that one. So instead of doing the handlebars, um, we're gonna uh, do the APIs, which um, I hope will help you to complete the assignment as well for this week. And that's just by running and creating our APIs. Okay, so um, I hope the uh, you know examples of these different AJAX calls can help will help you become useful. You will actually use these in the uh, the following week. But for now, I'm gonna go and uh, create the APIs for the back end. Right. So under Unit Six, I'm gonna create a new folder here, and we'll just do some really simple. I call I'll call it the back end. Okay, so just like before, uh, how we did last time, I'm going to initialize uh, the back end. This will be the server side. And let me close um, all these here. So I want to do an npm init and um, just accept the default setting. That's fine. You don't have to, if you want to change something else, that's okay. I'll just keep it as default. So now I have that back end initialized for. Uh, my, my application and I need to install the express. <clears throat> okay, and um, uh, do two things, Ex install the express and also another package called course for course origin resources. We want to allow it so that um, later on you do the next unit, you want to access it from the other server, You it, it will let you access those data. So install those two and then we will start should take a fairly short time to do that. Great, right? So that's done. So we're good to go. And now let's go and then create our index file. Package JSON says index is the, re is the root. So we're gonna do that inside here. Create an index. Yes. <clears throat> okay, if you wanna call something else, then you have to rename here the package file, but we'll create the index. So, just like before, uh, you want to do a constant express, load the express library, groups require. And then you also want to uh, initialize it right away as the app. That function. You also want to um, get the course, just require a course library. And then, um, <clears throat> and then uh, you want to use that course. So you can do like app.use. Actually, we'll do that later. Um, yeah, let's do the port first. So I have a port number. Um, I use the 8080. And then we're going to create a server. And this server will be. Um, just a link, right? So I use the HTTP and then we have local host and then port number at 
port number, okay? <clears throat> and then we can go ahead and listen to the port. So F then listen, and then we pass in the port number. And then we do the error function again and console log that to the console so you can access the server, okay? And we did this last time. <clears throat> and then now, that's done. So we want to go ahead and use the core. So app that use, and then we call the course function. This one here will um, <clears throat> allow cross origin. Okay. <clears throat> Resource. Oh, you are sharing. Okay, that's what the course is. So that means it allows other sites to access this site. So basically we actually whitelisting all the other APIs, I mean, uh, IP addresses. Okay, so then we go ahead and um, when, we, when we pass data over and coming back later, you can use it, but you can, um, you can skip that for now. Another useful um, thing to encode data is you can set this one here app that I uh, use the express dot URL encoder. You pass in here the extended as object, you pass the extended and then set that to false or true. I mean, you can figure it out, try it out. It just means that, you know, when data come in, you want to encode it, like all the HTML content, the backslashes and things like that. And also you want to use the JSON format. Press that JSON, call that function, and then all the data will be in JSON syntax. Okay, so these are the default settings for your application, really, um, the basic ones. Okay, and uh, just make sure that's work. We can go ahead and do a really simple dot get first, home directory. Again, arrow functions. This one here takes two parameters the response and request, request first, and then response second. And we'll do a request respond that um, send or just put like end here um, h1 hello okay so that's a typical setup set up and then run our file just do a um mp uh let's see node index if it's successful you should see this url this is the one that we printed right here, right? This is the link. And then if you open that, just click control click on it. It's gonna load um, this page here. So you can see it's working and then we're now good to go. <clears throat> okay, so this is our API. So an API, you know, usually you send data over, uh, not in HTML format. You usually send data in, um, uh, JSON data, right? So JSON data is the preferred way to send data over. And so instead of doing that way, you're going to do something like this. Instead of send that one, you're going to send the JSON, you call the JSON function and you pass some data over. Here is a JSON data object. Okay. So here you put like something like, um, I, mean, I mean, I guess the, the root page is okay. The home page is fine. We just cook, we just use that's fine. Okay. And then now these are your APIs. Okay, so APIs like you use for retrieval data, requires, you know, delete and update and things like that. Okay, so these are all the, uh, put here all the um, get APIs. Okay, we do a get here, that's a root. But usually you want to go to a different URL. Let's say, you know, something like, um, you know, slash API, right, like that. Okay, you wouldn't get the slash API. So here, I'm gonna do something similar to this one here. App that get slash API. When I get to that URL, then I'm gonna do a, um, the following. What am I returning to the user? Okay, so you return a JSON data of some sort. Okay, so for this exercise, we're gonna return some data. So first I'm gonna create an object uh, over here, uh, the backend. So I'll create a models folder, we'll call it models. 
And so the models folder, let's create a JSON data. We'll call it um, just, um, I don't know, uh, pets.json. Okay, in our pets.json file, we're gonna create an array of pets. So the first pet is the ID. And then we'll put here um, <clears throat> one, and then the name of the pet is um, <clears throat> Milo. And then the uh, the breed or the type of the pet, right? Call it um, a, a dog, a cat. It's one pet. I'll duplicate this. Do another one here, and we do three of them. One, uh, two, and three. This is the oldest. This is a dog. Okay, and this is a. Uh, um, uh, what should we call the next one? Let's put here as a fish, and we'll just call it koi. Okay, <clears throat> it's a fish. So it's Azure three pets, and then <clears throat> you want to export that out. So um, actually, not not JSON. Yeah, let's rename it. Let's rename it to um, let's do it differently. JS, pet JS, and I want to export this out. So you put here. Um, module let's put it let's put constant um pets equals that okay and then we do it the export so exports that pets is equal to pets okay we export it out remember the, the module stuff and then we and then import into our application up here so i'll import the pets so we do here um constant pets coming from um what do we use for yeah it's in the models folder so put here require dot slash models oops slash pets okay that is the pets object we export the pets. I just want to get the pets out of that, assign to a pets variable. And then I'm going to return the API get all the pets. So basically, I'm going to um, just send that out. Okay, all the pets out to that user. So go back to the terminal here, control, and then to it again. So again, if you have Noman, if you run Noman here, which I don't think, I don't know if I have it or not. Yeah, I do have it, okay? So if you don't have Nomon, just install Nomon, you know, npm install Nomon, and then you can use that in the terminal so I don't have to cancel run every time, okay? So this will stay, stay active. If you make any changes, I don't have to rerun the program again. So now if I check on the application, if I refresh now, you see that now the data of the pet comes through, okay? And that's what we want when we do these APIs. You want to be able to uh, send this type of data to the user. So if they come in here and they access this API, then that means it's a get API, get all the pets, and then send that data out. If you want to get a certain pet, you can go by the pet ID. Like if you want to get the first pet, you put ID one here like that. So it return only the first pet. Okay, so this is another API you can create. So over here, same thing. This one here will be something like this. This time, we're gonna match it with an ID. An ID uses angle bracket like this, okay? The angle bracket here signifies that it's become, it's gonna come here as a variable in the ID. And then you can, uh, um, actually not the bracket, no, that's 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 uh, PHP. Um, colon ID. Okay, the colon ID here is a variable that you can create, you can fetch from the parameters through the request object, and then you can search that, right? So here, I'm gonna get the ID from that. So you can say, let ID is equal to the request object. Okay, it has the parameters, as you can see, params dot ID. So this ID here is this ID here, okay? If you wanna call it something else, you would just call it R, then this would be R. Okay, so whatever this is called, you have to catch it 
that match it right here. So I call an ID, it's the pet ID. So if I look at the pet object, I use one of these IDs, okay? <clears throat> so I got that ID, then how do you search in that array, <clears throat> that array of data, okay? Um, you want to find the ID and you can use that in JavaScript has a function called um, find index. Okay, you're gonna find the index of this pet. So in this case, if we put over here, okay, so my pet object has ID for the first index, ID for the second index, and third and so forth here, right? So I put one, two, three, but it could have been like one, 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 and then two, two, two. Okay, let me like, let's put something meaningful. One, zero, one, and it's like uh, two, zero, two, and then, Three zero three, right? A little bit unique here. Okay, so if if I match this ID, it will return this object of the first index. So the pet of zero, pet of one, and things like that, right? So how do you do that? You you find the index step first. So I can find the index from the pets that find index. It's a function that does that. As you can see, it takes just the element. Okay, this find index will be will extract each of these element out in here as a um, variable. I call it data, and again, callback functions. A lot of callback functions here. Okay, and then what this will do this this will return the index position when I have a match. So again, I'm just doing a very simple comparison, so I don't have to do this curly braces just to that return the index when the data ID matches the ID here, okay? Maybe I should call it pet ID here, pet ID, okay? So this pet ID is compared against the ID from the data. Each data is actually each of these record. So compared to the first one, it's ID right here, 101, does it match this pet ID or not, okay? The only thing you wanna watch out for is that uh, in the pet object, these IDs are numbers. So if you wanna, uh, if, if there are integers, then you have to make sure that this pet ID you retrieve has to be an integer. That means you have to convert it to an integer. If you don't do that, uh, it may not work. Uh, sometimes I think, uh, you know, JavaScript is pretty smart enough to match it. If it doesn't, then you have to convert it back. Okay, so let's say that we're not going to convert it. We'll try it. If it matches that, then it comes back and we look at the index. So if it's not found, then the index will be a negative one. <clears throat> okay, if it's found, then you get the actual index position. Okay, so you can check to see if the index is a um, is not a negative one. That means it's found. If that's the case, then you want to return the pet of that single pet of i of the pet ID of the index. Okay, so you return the pet object of that index. Okay. Um, and then you return the pet over here. If it's not found, then you have to set the pet, right? So therefore you can set the pet up here first. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's, that's fine. So the pet, um, Let's let's do it this way. Let's do a um, let pet is equal to um, just the blank pet. Like um, uh, what should I do? Okay, let's just say it's empty. Okay, empty pet An array. You can put an empty object. It doesn't matter. I guess we'll see. If it's not empty, then we're going to replace it with the actual pet object, which is you know one of these, and then we we'll return that or turn that. Okay, so so let's see what happens. I'm going to save that, 
go to my app over here. And if I do a 101, right, you see that it returns just a single pet because you found that 101 ID, it returns that here. If I do a 102, I'm gonna get an empty pet, right? It's not found. So therefore it returns an empty pet object. If I do a 303, and I get queries data. Okay, so this is the API to get a particular ID. If you want to go by name, you can search by name if you want to. Then you can create another API, uh, you know, API slash, you know, the name, which is a, a text, and then you search in the name, and then all the pets that has the matching, uh, matching that name can be returned. So you can turn multiple, return multiple index indices or multiple records. Um, so that's a search you can do, right? Okay, so that is the get, is a get all the pets will get a single pet. Okay, and then you can also do the other ones. Um, this would be like the, um, the post API. The post here is for adding, right? Add new pet. Now we're not gonna be able to do this until you do the front end, which we'll do next time. But the setup, it will be, be very similar. The only difference is that in a post, you need to get the actual data coming in. So up here, we we'll do a app that post going to the same API. Because we're adding data, we're not gonna take any you know, IDs. So if it's not, um, in this case, you don't care about the ID. We're gonna add the data to the current pet object. Okay, so again, the same function, request response. Okay, so the data coming in through the request object again, um, the request has a property called the body that can retrieve all the data coming from a, like a form. Okay, so you want to get the data. So you can do something like um, constant uh, or let um, new pet is equal to the request that body. And that will get the data for the pet. And just you just want to make sure that the data coming in, you know, I guess has the same or similar uh, structure as this, the ID, the name, and then the type of the pet, okay? And once you get that, then you can go ahead and then uh, add it to the pets. So all you have to do is you just push it, okay? So pets that push, you push in the new pet. And then after that, then you want to return back to the user a message, like for example, maybe a successful or something, right? And it's a simple message just like, um, new pet added, something like that. So they can see the result. If there's any error, then you can construct your code to test that. If it's not a valid pet object, or if, you, if you're able to add data to your new pet, then throw a message and something like that. So the post is usually just like that. This is the payload. You add it to your new list and then you return response to the user. And this will be coming from like a form when you do a post, right? A post or you do the Ajax call and you send the data over back to the user. That's when we do a submit a form. It's either a get method or a post method for the form, okay? And, and the server will detect that type of a request. And then uh, the next one are your uh, put APIs. This is uh, for like uh, updating, okay, updating uh, existing pet or pets. And we just do one here. So the API would be similar. API goes to the API slash because you're editing a existing pet, you want to include the ID, you require the ID so you know which pet to you know, update. And then again, the function request response. So you have to search inside your pet, just like you did up here. And then you get the pet out of that. And then you can go ahead and update its pet or replace it, okay? So I'll do the same thing. I'm gonna get the ID or copy this right here. I need to search the index, basically the whole thing here for the pet ID. Once I found the pet ID index, then all I have to do is, I'm not gonna do this one here. I'm gonna do something like this. Pet index of that one is gonna be assigned to the 
um, the, the pet, which is in this case, the, um, we can do separately. I can do here, constant, uh, I can do this, not no pet, but the, the pet, right? And replace that pet with the pet, the updated pet, I guess. Okay. But it is the new data, right? So I'm, I'm just, I might be just changing the pet name, the pet uh, ID, or just the pet type, or all of them. I don't really care. I will replace the the existing pet here with the new type of pet. So if I find that it's looking at the pet of ID two zero two, I return the index here, and then pet of that index will be replaced with the new pet coming in, and then you have your new pet. And then once that's done. Then again, you return a message, um, you know, pet updated or something like that, if it's successful, okay? I didn't do the, you want to make sure you're able to do that. If, if it's not found, then you can say pet's not found and you can update. So kind of similar to what we had up here. Um, <clears throat> I did not do here the, the actual um, error, but you can also say, you know, uh, uh, you know, pet like status here. So you, so you do like this, constant status is say pet um, not found, the default message. So you can put this out here, the status here. And if you successfully update the pet, you change your status, say pet updated, right? So you get the message either, you know, no, no pet, or you update the pet and return here. So that's for the updating a single pet. If you want to update more than one pet, you have to pass in the object of those many pets. You have to you do a little bit more, but um, that's how you do it. So usually you have one API for the post, one for the update, and then you have the delete ones, right? So these guys are the deletes. Just delete, right? You'll be moving either a single pet from the ID or you can wipe out the entire pet. So this will be the app that delete going to the same API. I'm doing a delete, um, delete only one pet first. So again, you pass the ID, the request response, exactly same as above. I need to get the parameter. Once I know the index, I can, uh, uh, you know, I splice it. Okay, if you don't know that, you cannot um, splice it. So I got the ID. I'm going to search for the index, and then basically this whole thing here. So I, I also get the constant status. I mean, let's put that one here too. Okay. So I don't care about the payload because I'm not getting data. I'm just getting the data, the ID. If it's um, pets not found, if the ID doesn't match, right? If it's, if it's found, then I get the index. And then here, uh, what I'll do is I then, I'm not gonna do this, I'll do a pet dot splice. I'm gonna splice the pet at the index position. Okay. And then I'm gonna remove only one pet. All right, so we splice it, you remove one pet at the index position. If I found pet number 202, that's index of one, and then remove that out of the pet object, and then you say pet uh, deleted. Otherwise, it's not found. It's a single pet. And then we'll do one more here for the last one, which is the update um, delete. Oh. So this one here takes no ID because we don't want to care. And I'm gonna remove everything. So request response. And here, you don't really care about the ID. So you, you remove the entire thing, right? So my pet up here, I created, I'm using a, a constant, right? So I cannot like set pet equal to blank. If I don't do that, if it's not a constant, then you can easily do like pet is equal to blank and then you're done. But because it's an object, I can't do this, right? So if it's object, then you do a splice, just like up here, pass that splice, starting at the index position, and you leave it blank. So if you leave it blank here, it goes to infinity, right? 
So that means wipe out everything starting from the index of zero and then just delete the rest of your data. And that gives you an empty list, okay? And then here you return all pets deleted, okay? Again, you can check to see, make sure it's the pets object is still or not. Otherwise you just say, it's a very simple one for that one. Um, so there you go. This is how you would create all your APIs. Okay, and uh, how you call this is using uh, using uh, what the AJAX calls. You can use the fetch or the um, the AJAX HTML request or the jQuery AJAX. It doesn't matter how you do it. Is that you send data over, and we're going to delete this data, and we'll do this next week when we come back and do the front end. Okay, so your back end will look similar to what I just did here, except we're not doing pets. You'll be doing something with a books object. Okay, so I will stop here and we'll call it tonight. And so I think the unit eight, nine, or 10, maybe the 10 unit or so, we will, we will do the handlebars when we start to build out applications. And I'll show you also how to use that to pass data over from the, you know, the source here out to the view, which is a template. Okay, so we have the data binding thing going on again, uh, but this time it's for the handlebars uh, template. All right, so I'll uh, stop here and um, I will see you next week. Have a good weekend. And if you have any questions on the assignment, just shoot me an email, let me know, all right? Okay, see ya. Okay, good night. And bloop.